Good afternoon. Welcome to today's special lecture and webinar here in Portland, Oregon. And good day, good afternoon, good evening, or good very late evening to our global audience. My name is Patrick Hiller. I'm the director of the War Prevention Initiative by the Jubitz Family Foundation, and I teach conflict resolution here at Portland State University. On behalf of the War Prevention Initiative, the Rotarian Action Group for Peace, the Conflict Resolution Program here at Portland State, the Mark O. Hatfield School of Government, and Students United for Nonviolence. Um, I welcome you to this special lecture, Revealing an Increasingly Divided World, the 2015 Global Peace Index, by Aubrey Fox, who is the Executive Director of the Institute for Economics and Peace. In our global audience, I also would like to welcome our friends from our networks we've invited through the Peace and Security Funders Group, the Alliance for Peace Building, the International Peace Research Association, the Peace and Justice Studies Association, World Beyond War, and many other academic and grassroots networks that we are involved in. Our event will be recorded and made available on our websites probably within a few days afterwards. So after our introductions, we'll have the main uh, presentation by Aubrey Fox. And then we'll have three discussants uh, who will discuss the presentations and then also open the Q&A session. And there should be ample time for everyone to get the questions in also. Here at the War Prevention Initiative, the program I direct, we operate under some underlying assumptions. Two of them are, we are at a stage in human history where we can say with confidence that there are better and more effective alternatives to war and violence. And also, peace science and peace education provide a path to a more peaceful and just society. So we actively contribute to peace science and public scholarship on war prevention issues, and we provide evidence-based information on peace and conflict issues. One key area of our work is the advancement of the global peace system concept. Uh, so this is a concept where we have numerous undeniable trends in constructive conflict transformation, social change, and global collaboration. Today, we will hear about the Global Peace Index, which ranks the nations of the world according to their level of peacefulness based on a variety of qualitative and quantitative indicators. Work like this contributes to our understanding of what causes war and what the conditions for peace are. With work like this, we can actually help change the language and ultimately the behavior on all levels. Greetings, everyone. Uh, in my turn, I would like to welcome everyone here for this event. Um, I am here in a dual capacity uh, as the director of the Conflict Resolution Program here at Portland State, but also as a part-time executive director of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace. These are two organizations that are co-sponsoring uh, this event, and I would just like to share a few words about each of these uh, organizations. Uh, the Conflict Resolution Program is part of a long tradition of uh, academics and practitioners uh, who have ventured out to develop the fields of peace and conflict studies and conflict resolution to raise it to a credible academic level to develop theories, a range of theories for understanding the conditions under which conflict occurs, and to also develop strategies and perspectives and instruments that can facilitate peace resolution and peace building. The Rotarian Action Group for Peace, on the other hand, is a more practical and more action-oriented organization, hence the name, Rotarian Action Group for peace. It is a semi-autonomous organization under the umbrella of Rotary International. Uh, it has a worldwide uh, infrastructure in terms of the people it serves. Uh, Rotary is one of the largest civil society organizations in the world. Uh, it has various areas of focus, one of which, which is the focus that uh, leads the Rotarian Action Group for Peace, is the area of focus entitled Peace conflict prevention and resolution. Um, I would also like to add that over the last month, uh, a collaborative effort uh, has come to fruition that brought uh, the conflict resolution program uh, of Portland State and the Rotarian Action Group for Peace together in a memorandum of understanding through which we will seek to 
engage in collaborative activities, projects, research, placement of students uh, in, in uh, internships uh, in an attempt to bring theory and practice together by the collaborative efforts of these two organizations. The effort, I believe, will build capacity for both academia as well as Rotary. And this event is one such example of uh, this collaboration that brings it to you here and our global audience. Uh, but before I close, I would like to also extend a word of thanks uh, to Al and Ray Jubitz from the Jubitz Family Foundation for supporting not only this event, but several other uh, activities involving peace-building efforts in various sectors of society. Uh, I would also like to extend uh, our thanks to Dr. Birol Yeshilada, who is uh, one of the discussants from the Hatfield School of Government, and to Adam Vogel, from the Students, Students Union for Nonviolence, uh, who agreed to co-sponsor this event. And of course, I would like to also thank the entire, entire team of the War Prevention Initiative, uh, which worked uh, ceaselessly to put all the details together for this event. Uh, but before I close, I would also like to acknowledge uh, the presence among us of the chair of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace, uh, Mr. Gordon Cran who traveled all the way from Toronto to be with us today. So without further ado, we can move to the next part of our program. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Duchala, and I work with the Rotarian Action Group for Peace. And I'm also a second year conflict resolution graduate student. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our main speaker. Aubrey Fox is Executive Director of the United States Office of the Institute for Economics and Peace, a nonprofit think tank dedicating to shifting the world's focus to peace as a positive, achievable, and tangible measure of human well-being and progress. The Institute for Economics and Peace is best known for publishing the annual Global Peace Index, the world's leading measure of national peacefulness. A published author, he also has extensive experience in the nonprofit sector. For nearly 15 years, prior to joining the Institute for Economics and Peace, Aubrey was a member of the senior leadership team of the Center for Court Innovation, an organization which helps the justice system aid victims, reduce crime, strengthen neighborhoods, and improve pu pu public trust excuse me, and justice. His work included launching the Center for Justice Innovation, an institution that seeks to promote thoughtful criminal justice reform in the United Kingdom. His work has appeared in several newspapers, magazines, and journals. He also is the co-author of Trial and Error and Criminal Justice Reform, Learning from Failure. It is our honor to welcome Aubrey Fox. And Aubrey, we hope that your two-year-old daughter is staying awake to watch you back in New York. Um, thank you, Natalie. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to wander around a little, but I'm going to try to stay in my penalty box and not drive the videographer too crazy. Um, before I begin, I, I did want to thank, uh, in particular, Al Jubitz and Patrick Hiller for putting on this wonderful event and for inviting me uh, to come to Portland. It's such a pleasure to be here and, and to see all the amazing work that's being done here, whether it's the War Prevention Initiative or the the Rotary Action Group for Peace uh, and Conflict Resolution Program. It just feels like such a, a hub and a center for, for peace activity. And that's terrific uh, for me to see, because one of the things that uh, we've been thinking about and talking about, and talking about with Patrick in particular, is this idea of the growing professionalization of the peace field. Uh, and that's such a, a welcome development, I think, uh, to see this peace field evolve and grow. And I think one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is whether it's possible to bring some of the tools of hard science and statistical analysis uh, to the study of peace. That's what my institution, the Institute for Economics and Peace, attempts to do. Uh, before I begin, I do have to make some observations about Portland. You know, sort of maybe like rock star standard of talking about the city you're appearing in. Not that I'm a rock star. Um, Portland is famously nice, right? That's the reputation of the city. And I, I feel like it has lived up to that reputation. This is a beautiful space. The organizers got me a flower, which is really rare. I'm, I may water it during my talk if I feel so moved. 
Uh, my, uh, Natalie mentioned my two-year-old daughter. She loves trains, so when the trolley trundles by, I feel like she would be extremely jealous uh, of the fact that I'm here and that she's not able to see the, the trolley go by. And in true kind of family-friendly fashion, I feel compelled to add that uh, David, who's in the back, and Natalie just got married over the weekend. And they're, they're here. I don't know if this counts as a honeymoon. I, I hope not. <laughs> OK, so that, the jokes portion of my presentation is now over. Everyone can now relax. Um, so I'm here to talk about this piece, signature piece of research that my uh, global think tank, the Institute for Economics and Peace, puts out every year. It's called the Global Peace Index. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting the findings from the most recent edition of the Global Peace Index, which is the ninth edition. Uh, and it comes out every year. And it is an attempt to provide a comprehensive statistical picture of the state of peace in the world and to understand some of the economic consequences of violence. What is violence costing the world economy? Um, and you'll notice again that I'm using the language of numbers. And our, the title of my organization is the Institute for Economics and Peace. And so I, I just want to pause for a moment and talk a little bit about that. One of the things that my organization is trying to do is really bring a kind of hard and sharper focus to the study of peace. So I think the idea is that in, in some instances, peace has been kind of caricatured, probably unfairly, as being very abstract and aspirational. Um, but what we think we may be able to add is more of a hard-nosed look at the facts about peace. And you know, there's an old cliche that if you can't measure something, it won't matter. If you can't track something over time, people won't be able to know whether things are getting better or worse. Um, and so our goal is to bring that kind of framework and mindset um, to the study of peace. And I think you all can sit in this room and ask yourself whether or not we're succeeding. It's a fair question, because it is, in fact, a very difficult assignment. Um, when we talk about peace, we're looking at the intersection of a lot of incredibly complicated global dynamics. And one of the things that we try to do, again, as an institution, is take a lot of very complex ideas and present them in a simple, easy to understand way. And so I think that our, our assumption is that by doing so, we're adding to the stock of public knowledge and we're adding to understanding. But it's fair to ask if we're simplifying things too much. What are we leaving out? What are we choosing to put into our analysis? Um, and so let's go into some of the things that we found in this uh, Global Peace Index. So again, just a little bit more detail about the organization that I work for. We're an independent, non-for-profit think tank dedicated to building a greater understanding of the key drivers and measures of peace and to identifying the economic benefits that increased peacefulness can deliver. Our headquarters is in Sydney, Australia, but we also have offices uh, in New York and Mexico City. We have, we have kind of an interesting backstory that's worth talking about. Um, our founder is a very successful Australian IT entrepreneur. His name's Steve Killalay. Uh, he started at two companies that are both publicly listed. He's the chairman and still very involved in one of those companies called Integrated Research, um, which uh, provides very technical software to major banking clients that resolve technical issues um, in their computer systems. So he's, a, he's kind of a, an engineer. He's a numbers guy. In his business life, he's always built his businesses on the basis of metrics, understanding the size of his markets, understanding what kind of profit margin he can expect, having very specific and targeted strategic goals for each unit of his business operation. And Steve is, also has this other side of himself, which is an avid surfer, peace lover, someone who's very engaged in the big public issues of the day. And he started a charitable foundation which allows him to travel all over the world. And he started to ask himself as he went throughout Africa and many of the countries where he, his charitable foundation is active, 
you know, is there a tool out there that can tell me whether country A is more or less peaceful than country B? Is there a ranking that will tell me um, about the countries of the world and whether they're peaceful or not? He couldn't find it. So being an entrepreneurial guy, he decided I'm gonna create it myself. And so that's the origin of the Global Peace Index. And out of the Global Peace Index, the Institute for Economics uh, and Peace was born. So I think, in a way, that's another interesting comment on the professionalization of the peace field, that it's starting to bring in new kinds of skills and new kinds of people um, into its orbit. And that's, again, I think an enormously uh, positive development. Okay. So I mentioned that the Global Peace Index is in its ninth year. What we do is we rank 162 countries that covers about 99% of the world's population. Um, and we use 23 indicators uh, that are weighed on a one to five scale. One is good, five is bad. Uh, it's developed by us, but we do it in partnership with a number of important organizations. So we have a, uh, an expert panel. That expert panel helps us decide on what indicators to include in our research and helps us decide what weights to give to each of the indicators. So there's an independent process outside of us that helps provide some accountability for the process. We also use a lot of data that's collected by the Economist Intelligence Unit. That's part of the Economist Magazine group. They employ experts in countries around the world and where there are gaps in the data, we prefer quantitative data, but when you're covering 162 countries, often these countries don't have the capacity to collect data on particular issues. We fill in those gaps with data that's collected by these country experts that are, that are employed by The Economist. Okay, so I, I mentioned there are 23 indicators. They're in three different buckets. Um, one bucket are measures of ongoing domestic and international conflict. Things like intensity of organized internal conflicts, relations with neighboring countries, and so on. We also look at measures of societal safety and security. Number of refugees and internally displaced people being an example, and that's obviously a huge issue at this moment in time. The impact of terrorism, homicide, and incarceration rates. And then seven measures of militarization. Another way to cut this is that we measure both internal peace, so peace within a country, and external peace, which is the state of peace between countries. And, and I think one of the kind of foundations of our work is how we're defining peace, right? So I just want to make sure we all are, understand our approach to this. So when we say we are measuring peace, what are we measuring? Um, there is a classical definition of peace that says that it is the opposite of war. But we have a more expansive definition. And one of the themes that I'll talk about is that uh, we are seeing in the world that the nature of everyday violence is changing. Um, the definition that we use for peace, which is a very clear definition, uh, and I think would make sense to people, is the absence of violence or fear of violence. So, Definitions are important, and I think one of our intellectual contributions is to, is to be absolutely clear and succinct about what we understand to be peace, and what we understand to be a peaceful society. And so this idea of peace being the absence of violence or fear of violence in our field would be called negative peace. Um, a little later, I'll get into a separate strand of analysis that we're starting to build up, which is, we call positive peace, which is about the presence of factors that make for peaceful societies. What are the attitudes, institutions, and structures of more peaceful societies? The Global Peace Index and its 23 indicators, again, measures negative peace, things you don't want to have happen in your countries. But we're also interested in understanding, OK, well, what is it that makes for more peaceful societies? And that we capture in our work on positive peace. OK, so what did we find in the ninth edition of the Global Peace Index? A few highlights. So if you read the paper, it feels like doom and gloom is all around us. The walls are closing in. Uh, things are going terribly. But in fact, if you look at the average level of peacefulness across, across all 162 countries, it has remained roughly the same um, from 2013 to 2014, the period of which we were studying. However, that really doesn't tell the whole story. One of the themes that uh, was central to our Global Peace Index this year and got a lot of media coverage and pickup 
is this notion that we developed of growing peace inequality. So we're, we're very familiar with this idea of income inequality now. People talk about the haves and the have-nots in terms of income and resources. But what we're finding is that uh, we are also observing an incredible increase in what we call peace inequality. And what that means is that the most peaceful nations in the world and regions of the world are becoming more and more peaceful, while the, the least peaceful nations and regions of the world are becoming less and less peaceful. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, but you have to decide, is the, class, is the glass half full or half empty? And I think we tend to think in terms of half empty, but we should remember that the fact that regions of the world, like Europe, are more peaceful than they have been in their recorded history. So what is it about a place like Europe that is making it so peaceful? How can we learn more from their experience? And is it possible to transfer some of those lessons to other countries? Those are some of the questions that, that we're thinking about. So um, overall, things remain the same. But in the last year, we've seen deterioration driven by uh, increases in deaths from internal conflict, so civil wars and conflict within, within a nation. A very uh, striking increase in terrorist activity. Uh, and a, a one-year dip in what we've recorded for UN peacekeeping funding. So some improvements over the last year. Um, we've seen some improvements in homicide rates, although caution, that could be a function of how homicide rates are calculated, which are under flux, and um, we're not totally sure that this measures a real phenomenon. But also, we have seen improvements in the number of external conflicts fought, war between nations, uh, and some improvements in uh, uh, political instability. So no surprise here, Syria remains the world's least peaceful nation, tiny Iceland, is the most peaceful. So we, we uh, a little story, we had, uh, uh, I'm based in New York, and we had some events during UN General Assembly week, and we had a little cocktail party. And the Prime Minister of Iceland came to our cocktail party just so he could take a picture with the chairman of our organization and tweet it out. So I think that's a sign of success. I, although, you know, if you're, Syria would not send someone to take a picture with us at this moment in time. So. It probably shouldn't totally surprise you that Iceland is a peaceful place, um, but there are some countries that I find surprising in terms of improvement in the last year. Guinea-Bissau and Cote d'Ivoire show the largest improvement. There are some countries, particularly countries that are coming out of ongoing civil conflict um, that are enjoying the benefits of, of not having those conflicts. Um, Libya and Ukraine have the largest drop. Again, shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. I mentioned Europe's peace improvement and its unique place in the world. And then you find Middle East and North Africa the least peaceful region um, for the first time. So it's a state of flux. Things are changing. Um, and that's one of the values of, of tracking this year after year that you can measure these changes. Um, we have a map. Uh, red is bad. Uh, <laughs> blue and green is good. Um, so you can see kind of visually represented some of the, the variation um, in the world. OK, so if you go back to the beginning of the Global Peace Index, what have we observed as trends? Now, many of you are familiar with Steven Pinker's hypothesis that the world has become ex much more peaceful over millennia. There's no doubt that that is true. However, what we have found in the last eight years um, is that the world has become slightly less peaceful. So it's all a question of time frames. If you go back um, centuries or more, you will find the world has become much more peaceful. Um, in the last eight years, again, we've recorded a slight deterioration in peace, somewhat concerning. Uh, if you look at the deterioration or improvement by domain, you find the largest deterioration in safe, the safety and security domain, an improvement in, in militarization, right? So we actually see a little less um, uh, military activity uh, and a deterioration, so um, uh, not an improvement uh, in ongoing conflict. So deaths from internal conflict and the impact of terrorism are the largest deteriorations over an eight-year period. And again, you have this theme of uh, some countries improving and some countries deteriorating. Okay. 
All right, this, is, this speaks to this idea that, of the changing nature of peace. Uh, essentially, what we're finding is that um, there is less conflict occurring between nations, but more conflict occurring within nations. So another way of saying that is that, yes, um, war and ongoing violence is still a huge problem for the world, but everyday criminal violence is becoming more and more of a problem. Um, so countries like Mexico and Colombia um, have huge violence problems, urban violence problems. All of, many of uh, the countries in Latin America are experiencing that. Um, but they are not fighting each other. Mexico is not about to invade Guatemala. But they have a lot of problems within their borders. Um, if you look at uh, some of the individual indicators within the Global Peace Index, the areas that have improved the most are UN peacekeeping, although that dipped a little over the last year, and again, this notion of external conflict. But you can see uh, some of the areas where things have not gotten better, have gotten worse, in fact. So a lot of talk about terrorism. Um, we do a separate Global Terrorism Index, um, which just looks at terrorism deaths and terrorism incidents in 162 countries. It's a very interesting project we do in partnership with the START Center at the University of Maryland, which holds something called the Global Terrorism Database. It's a, a very thorough cataloging of all terrorist incidents in the world. And we use their data to construct both the terrorism indicator, that's one of the 23 in our index, and our Global Terrorism Index. And you know, so much of life, I think, is about uh, kind of incremental change. So what we're seeing here is uh, death from terrorism growing by almost, almost 600% if you go from 2002 to 2014. So le le from around 5,000 to over 30,000 deaths a year. Now, to put that into context, best estimates are a, just south of 500,000 people are murdered every year. So I think we should be careful to remember that you're much more likely to die as a result of a homicide than you are from a terrorist attack. However, it's unquestionably true that there's something going on here um, where the impact of terrorism is growing and growing in almost exponential ways. And I don't know if we included this graph in this presentation, but I, I mean, without getting too polemical, I think you can look at certain incidents in our past and see where this increase is coming from. Um, we know that 82% of terrorist deaths occur in five countries. Um, a lot of these countries are countries that the US has intervened in. Iraq, um, the spillover to Syria, uh, Afghanistan. And so I think we have to be cognizant of the law of unintended consequences. Um, but the other point to make here is that terrorism is a, is a concentrated phenomenon, right? So I said earlier, 82% of deaths in five countries. Two-thirds of terrorist activity um, is generated by five terrorist groups. Um, OK. Uh, refugees and internally displaced people, an enormous increase um, over the last 10 years. It's estimated and now is well known that half of the uh, citizens of Syria are either refugees or internally displaced. Uh, another enormous burden uh, on the world. Back to this idea of, of inequality and peace. This to me is a, a really striking finding that if you look at the top 20 countries and the bottom 20 countries in the rankings, um, 500 million people live in the 20 most peaceful nations in the world, but 2 billion people live in the 20 least peaceful nations in the world. So I think that just shows you how striking um, this notion of peace and equality is. Um, and I think it's now popular to talk about the number of people who live on less than a dollar a day, for example. Like that has gotten into the argot. People talk about that a lot. But I don't think people talk about the number of people who live with less than X amount of peace every year. And we found that that's two billion people. Enormous number. OK. Um, we're, one of the things that we also like to do is kind of 
spot issues that are going to be emerging for the world. So we did a little analysis of the relationship between urbanization and peace. We know a lot more people are going to be living in cities than are living now by the year 2050. A lot of complicated debate in the field about whether urbanization adds to more peace or less peace. Um, the bottom line is that, in general, over time, more urbanization leads to more peace because you have more economic activity and commerce, and those things tend to be associated with peace. However, worryingly, we also know that urbanization, when combined with poor governance, poor criminal justice systems, and high levels of corruption, lead to much less peace. So if you look at this chart, it basically says that the 2.5 billion additional people who will be living in cities by the year 2050, of that total, close to 2 billion will be in countries that currently have lower, very low levels of peacefulness. So how do you help manage this urban transition in countries that um, are already struggling to maintain peacefulness? So we're the Institute for Economics and Peace. We also like to count up the cost of violence to the world's economy. Um, again, this is part of our effort to um, make the case for peace in different ways. Um, peace is not just a moral uh, and human goal. Peace also has uh, an economic benefit that's quite vast, actually. So in our estimates, and these are probably conservative, we account a global cost of violence at about $14 trillion a year, 13.4% of the world's GDP. And I'll get into how we do that in a minute, but I think the important point is that you know, we live in a world now where we think about sectors of public policy like healthcare and education. We say, or, you know, this accounts for X percent of our country's GDP. Are we getting enough bang for our buck? And that's essentially the healthcare debate. Lots of cost consciousness and a lot of debate about could we spend less and get more from the system. But we don't think of, of violence in the same way. I think we just keep spending the money and not really thinking about it. And so that's part of our goal is to drive people thinking about it as an industry, in fact. Um, and are we getting what we want from it? Now, we, we estimate uh, the cost of violence in each of the 162 countries in the world. And one story I told earlier was um, I, I feel like we're getting some traction with this kind of analysis. There was a recent article in The Economist about Colombia's peace process. And it was saying, isn't it great? They're about to sign peace accords. Colombia might be able to turn a page. But according to the Institute for Economics and Peace, Colombia spends 18% of its economy on violence. And it really has to lower that if it's going to develop. So for us, that was a wonderful uh, citation because it communicates not just that we're being taken seriously by this establishment publication, but that people's mindsets are changing. Um, if, if a writer for The Economist can just drop a fact like that into a story without consulting us, um, then I think that's good news. And you know, we'd like to see more of that. Um, so, and you know, we've been able to track pretty um, large increases in the global cost of violence from 2008. So, and here are some of the uh, places where that increase has really been particularly acute. Okay, so this is, this is kind of a complicated chart, but it gives you a sense of, of how we measure um, the cost of violence containment. So just to give you a couple examples, um, military expenditure is obviously one big category, but we also look at um, direct spending on criminal justice, but what you would call in, the indirect cost of violence. So homicides, for example. If you're killed at 30, the economy has lost your lifetime earnings. Enormous cost. And there's some quite good estimates of the cost of a homicide in the US economy. Um, some very good um, economic analysis that we've been able to use and apply across the world. Um, you also have things like internal security, so private security services. Um, you can see that UN peacekeeping is just a tiny sliver, right? So, um, and that has been growing quite rapidly. Uh, and the other thing that we do that isn't on this, ch this chart, which is I find very interesting is when we total up violence containment costs, we, have a, we, we include direct costs, so 
the cost of um, employing a police officer or someone in the military, indirect costs like the lost lifetime earnings of a homicide victim. But we also have a multiplier effect. Um, the old cliche is that war is good for the economy. But that is, nobody, no serious economist believes that anymore. That's the good news. Um, whether that's penetrated public consciousness is a different matter. So a commonly used um, uh, uh, economic figure for the opportunity cost of spending on violence is to do a $1 to $1 multiplier. So essentially that says if you spend $10 um, employing someone in the military, that $10 could be spent more effectively somewhere else. So you haven't just lost the $10, you've lost the opportunity to spend it on something that might be worth $20. Um, so that's how we come to um, this uh, analysis. All right, so I, I'm, I'm gonna close by talking about this, uh, our new and evolving work on positive peace. So again, at the very beginning, what I said was the global peace index ranks negative peace. These 23 indicators are things that you don't wanna have in your country. But I don't, it's not enough for us to just study negative peace. Because what we want to do, in fact, is understand what steps we can take to build more peaceful societies. Um, and I think the broader aspiration is to really, you know, when we talk about peace, so often what we end up doing is, is studying conflict and violence. It's almost like an inevitable gravitational pull towards that side of the ledger. So as an institution, we feel like we have a responsibility to try to change that narrative so that we can actually start talking about peace. And what does peace mean? What drives peace? And it turns out the dynamics of peace are very different than the dynamics of violence and conflict. Um, but what we have done is create, uh, an, again, an empirically based model of what we call positive peace, the attitudes, institutions, and structures of more peaceful societies. So um, here again, what we're saying is that we use a similar process for coming up with the positive peace index as we do for coming up with a global peace index, where we've looked at thousands of data sets. And because we have um, the global peace index, we're able to, to through complicated statistical analysis, um, which really is just a way of saying that I don't understand it. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> We've been able to figure out which of the positive peace factors are most closely correlated with the negative peace rankings, right? So we're not, we're not making judgments a priori about what factors we think are important in a society. What we're saying is that because we have this rich data set that goes back nine years and we have a lot of data about positive peace, we're able to look at which of these many factors and variables seem to have the strongest relationship to movements and negative peace. Okay. So as with the Global Peace Index, with the Positive Peace Index, we're able to rank 162 countries. We, we use 24 indicators, which are uh, grouped in eight domains. Um, and here, here are eight factors. I don't, there's nothing up here that I think should come as a surprise to people. <laughs> So what we're saying is that countries that have these attributes tend to be more peaceful. They have, a, they have an underlying institutional capacity for peace. So things like sound business environment, well-functioning government, low levels of corruption, acceptance of the rights of others, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we know um, that these factors predict a lot of really interesting things. And I'll get into that in a minute. Countries with higher levels of positive peace do better in a range of ways that are actually quite fascinating. So um, here's the information presented on a map. Um, again, you look at the top 10 positive peace countries. Um, not a surprise, you've got Nordic countries. You know, Finland is ranked sixth in the Global Peace Index and fourth in the Positive Peace Index. And we, again, we did an event at the UN and the, uh, the Finnish permanent representative to the UN raised his hand and he said, uh, 
Um, we've definitely never been described as the sixth happiest country in the world. So I'm glad to see that we're described as the sixth most peaceful country in the world. Um, these are the, the bottom 10 countries in positive peace. And I think both, in both instances, one thing to observe is that how little change you find between 2005 and 2015. So I think New Zealand was the only country in 2000, New Zealand and Australia were out of the top 10 in 2005, but are now in the top 10 in 2015. In every other case, they've stayed the same. Uh, a little bit more variation in um, the bottom 10, but not a ton. So, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about positive peace is that it takes a lot longer for the factors to move, right? So in, in the global peace index rankings, there's a little more um, dynamism. The countries move around a little bit, particularly in the middle. But with positive peace, it actually takes a lot longer. And you can imagine why. I mean, take a factor like high levels of human capital. You have to invest 15 years into a student's education in order for that to pay off. Um, I mean, it, it, there are all sorts of implications to this finding. One is that we have to be we have to think differently about time frames and impact, and we can't expect a lot of immediate impact um, in certain instances. So here's another practical application of, of positive peace. Now remember that positive peace, another way of thinking about it is a country's potential for peace. And that could be the same or different than their actual peace levels. Um, in fact, there are, one of the things that's really interesting about the model is looking at countries where the, their negative peace scores and their positive peace scores are out of whack. If you go back to 2008 and you look at um, countries that had a lower capacity for peace than their actual peace levels would suggest, so we would call that a positive peace deficit, of the 30 countries, by 2015, 22 of them had actually declined in peace. And so a classic example is Syria. So in the, 10 years ago, um, in, the, in a global peace index ranking, it would have been ranked in the middle. Because essentially you had a country where their leaders, through authoritarian rule, were imposing a lid on the society. But the underlying dynamics of the society were quite turbulent. And so they, they ranked something like in the mid-80s in global peace negative piece, but in the much lower, like 40 places lower in positive piece. So in that sense, you know, I think it's foolish to over, um, be overly confident in, in anyone's predictive capabilities. Positive piece is an interesting leading indicator of both future falls in peace or rises in peace. If you were betting on a country to do better in the next decade, you might actually bet on Mexico. And we do a lot of work in Mexico. We have a Mexico peace index. We just opened a permanent office there. Mexico has much higher levels of positive peace than its actual peace levels would suggest. OK. So again, you know, is the world becoming more or less peaceful? We, in the global peace index rankings, we find small decreases in peace, but lots of areas of the world that are getting a lot more peaceful, and a lot of areas of the world are getting a lot less peaceful. The story for positive peace is different. It's much more positive. So you actually find 72% um, of countries that we measured improving their levels of positive peace between 2005 and 2015. And that's actually not an unfamiliar story to a lot of people who, who follow broad humanitarian trends, right? So many of you are probably familiar with the Millennium Development Goals, which guided the world's work um, through the United Nations from 2000 to 2015. They didn't get all eight goals that they laid out right. They didn't do it perfectly, but they made huge progress. So I think some of that progress is reflected in our positive peace scores. Another really interesting factor of the model is that um, if you have weak positive peace, not only are you, this is a very, <laughs> this is a very complicated chart. <laughs> I'm gonna make a simple point. <laughs> I'm just going to confuse you and make you think I'm much smarter than I really am. But, but what that basically says is that 
when a country has low levels of positive peace, their peace levels fluctuate a lot. They're very volatile. Um, and so that suggests that countries with low levels of positive peace aren't very resilient. They don't, if a shock occurs, they're likely to really suffer from that shock. So an example might be um, if you look at Iceland, had the, the Iceland's economy melted, and yet they recovered really quickly. Japan had a tsunami and a nuclear accident. I mean, these are obviously hugely troubling events in the country's history, but they have mostly recovered. Haiti had a hurricane and hasn't recovered, essentially. So one of the things that we think our positive peace model offers is, is another way of looking at this issue of resilience, which is very popular now in um, global circles. What is a country's capacity to withstand an external or internal shock? I mentioned the Millennium Development Goals. There's, there's a lot of um, correlation between a country's ability to meet its MDGs and its level of positive peace. And this has been an interesting debate that's occurring within humanitarian and development circles, where essentially now there is um, a new consensus that you can't have development without peace, nor can you have peace without development. So in the new version of the Sustainable Development Goals that were just passed by the United Nations and will go from 2015 to 2030, they added an explicit peace goal. So the old Millennium Development Goals were very focused on uh, humanitarian issues. Girls' access to education, maternal health care, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, income. Uh, the new framework has all those goals, but it also has an explicit focus on a country's ability to achieve peace within its borders. And that is very much driven by this acknowledgement that countries that aren't at peace, that have a lot of conflict and violence, they, can't, they don't function. They can't meet humanitarian goals. You can't separate these two things out. All right, so um, this is one of the more interesting findings, I think, and it speaks to some great work that you guys are doing here around the, the, um, the power of nonviolent resistance. Um, and I understand that you're having Erica Chenoweth uh, on campus in a couple weeks, and I would strongly urge each of you to go see her. She's a wonderful speaker. Um, a lot of great research that she's developed um, on the power of nonviolent resistance. What we did is we took Erica's data. She has an extensive database that looks at uh, nonviolent resistance campaigns, and we studied it through the lens of positive peace. And essentially, we found that uh, in countries with high levels of positive peace, they have fewer resistance movements. The resistance movements tend to be uh, more likely to be nonviolent, more limited in their aims, and more successful. As you go up, go down the positive peace scale, you find that countries with low levels of positive peace tend to express their conflict through violent means, tend to have sweeping and essentially non-achievable goals and tend to fail. Um, so the point isn't that conflict shouldn't or doesn't arise in societies. Of course it does. The point is, how is conflict expressed and how is it resolved? Um, and I think this field of understanding the dynamics of nonviolent resistance is really about to explode. Um, and it's going to be fascinating to watch uh, how we understand this. We're able to look at some individual countries. So Myanmar is a country we're very interested in. It's obviously a troubled country. It's not perfect, but uh, it has uh, improved in many categories. Um, so these are all the gray bar is Myanmar compared to the darker gray bar of global averages. Oh, well, that's slightly different on the screen. I'm not colorblind. <laughs> um, so free flow of information in particular, uh, much uh, improved in Myanmar. By the way, that's one of the indicators for that is um, a percentage of the population that uh, has a cell phone, right? So that's interesting, right? That's sort of a kind of an accidental peace building technique. Give everyone a cell phone. Um, give them a sort of smart or semi-smart cell phone and suddenly they have access to a lot of information. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done. So just wanted to summarize again what we do at the Institute for Economics and Peace. So again, we're peace metrics people. That's our kind of unique intellectual contribution. 
We measure and analyze peace. We look at the factors that create peace. Um, and we try to understand the, the lost opportunity costs of violence. <laughs> and then it all concludes with action. So um, We are trying to get better at predicting country risk uh, and violence, trying to come up with better cost-benefit analysis. Um, and hopefully that will lead to better outcomes. So uh, here are some of our research reports. Um, I actually would encourage you to go to our wonderful website, which is www.visionofhumanity. I'm going to do a little free advertisement here. So we have all of our indices on this website. So you can see the Global Peace Index, the Terrorism Index. We have three country indices. And you can search. We have an interactive map. So you can highlight a country and find out what you want about that country. If, you, if I clicked on it, it would pull up all the indicators and the indicator scores. You can, you can either do that by the map or by just selecting a country. And you can even just look at whatever indicator you care about. And we'll tell you the map will reorganize itself according to that um, indicator. So please go on visionofhumanity.org um, and play around with it. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Aubrey. And uh, could I ask our discussants now to sit? Yeah, all three of you, maybe. OK, I would now like to introduce our discussants for this evening. Over on your right is Rachel Cunliffe, uh, is a professor of conflict resolution at Portland State University. Her criminal justice activism and extensive research agenda encompass topics ranging from Oregon's death penalty to restorative justice and nonviolent responses to extreme violence. She runs a compassionate listening project with those entangled in the death penalty system and is also a trained mediator and facilitates victor offender, offender meetings. Barol. Yeshalada is a professor of political science and international studies at Portland State University. He is also holder of the Endowed Chair in Contemporary Turkish Studies and director of the Center for Turkish Studies in the Mark O. Hatfield School of Government. Dr. Yeshalada has been an invited policy consultant at various departments of the US government, the Council on Foreign Relations, the US Institute of Peace, the Rand Corporation, Booz Allen Hamilton, the Nathan Associates, Barclays Capital, the World Bank, and is an academic associate of the Atlantic Council. Van D. Kanyako is professor of conflict resolution at Portland State University. From 2004 to 2005, he was coordinator of the UN NGO Conflict Prevention Working Group in New York, which brought together participants from governments, the UN and civil society from around the world to explore the role of civil society in conflict prevention. He has written widely on civil society and the political economy of conflict. Everyone, please welcome our discussants. Well, it's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, among you and to be introduced um, firsthand. I was aware of the index and, and looked at it and used it in the past. And I have to tell you, uh, my comments will be based on the contribution of this work to our scholarly world. This is music to my ears. Um, I'm known as a numbers cruncher, <laughs> um, come from science into political economy and international conflict analysis. Um, in, in my field, I'm part of two very large projects that use uh, data to get at heart of how world's changing. One is performance of nations based on power transition theories, a uh, product of the long um, University of Michigan projects. And we have a website 
that taps and, and shows you uh, the rise and decline of nations in terms of political capacity. And it, like yours uses a lot of data, but not the peace index. This is a tremendous opportunity for us to complement our work in the study of rise and decline of nation states, and also in testing the probability of conflict or cooperation between any given two countries uh, in world affairs and make projections. So like the old correlates of war project that looked at the degree of conflict between states, this is the flip side of the coin for me. And it's, it's fairly new. Correlates of war project started in 1961. It's been going on. Uh, one of my former professors, the late David Singer started it. And, but in, the, in his heart was, how do we study wars to prevent wars? Well, there's another project that I think this study is going to benefit from, uh, and you might be in, in your research team looking at this. Uh, when you look at the positive side of peace, at the heart of that for me lies measure of trust and tolerance at the individual level. And that is often missed in the uh, data sets looking at the degree of violence and nonviolence in countries. Those are the products, but what lies at the heart of it beneath is often not measured, like the events data uh, that one can look at. This is much more powerful than the events data. And I applaud you uh, for getting this going. There is tremendous use for this, and I know my colleagues in, in the international relations, international studies world will be using this in years to come. It's getting better and better. Um, and just a comment, I think your research team, if you haven't looked at it, should tap into the expanding array of data sets we now have uh, from the World Values Survey, uh, I'm part of that, I'm one of the PIs, European Value Survey, and the newcomers, the Arab Barometer, and similar ones that are emerging, and where individuals are tapped at the individual level, the level of trust. I was shocked to see the level of general trust in the United States has declined, not surprising, but the trust level, you, know, you asked the question, can uh, ordinary people be generally trusted? Can you trust them? Is that a 46% now in the United States in the last survey? And I suspect two years from now it will be a little lower. Um, and you know what pushes that? It's a domestic level of, and we can feel it, the rising tensions, divisiveness, and so forth, and tolerance, or lack thereof. Um, it would be an excellent um, complementary measure, if you will, to the measure of positive peace. I was uh, uh, tickled to, <laughs> when you said the measure of happiness. You know, and we ask that question: How happy are you? And then follow it with other, you know, financial happiness, health, etc. But it's an important thing when you think about it. You know, happy people don't go kill each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a decree of, uh, there's some decree of trust there. In, in, you know, why are these countries that are high on your, um, the positive peace are at the same time happy people? There's some underlying currents in, in that. This is not just for public information. This is going to open doors for us researchers in the field of peace studies. Scientific study of international processes. It's actually a field section in, in ISA. It's been looking for stuff like this. And not only me, my colleagues in, in this section of ISA are quite excited that this is continuing. Please don't stop it. Keep it coming because I see a future for it just like the Correlates of War project. It's still continuing and getting better and better. Okay. All right, thank you. 
Um, thank you, Aubrey, for uh, such a, a refreshing um, presentation. Um, the question in your presentation, the question that you posed, I think, uh, throughout your presentation really stood out for me uh, in that, um, is the world becoming more or less peaceful? Um, I think the conclusion that I drew from the presentation is, um, you know, by and large, uh, it is um, a mixed bag. There's been a lot of improvement, and uh, there's also a lot of ways to go. Uh, in order to make the world really, truly peaceful. Uh, but I think the key to answering or understanding this particular question um, also depends on a lot of variables. So for example, uh, if you're somebody that follows the news, the local news or international news, I think it's very easy to sort of fall into the trap of believing that the world is spinning out of control. And so in a way, it is refreshing to actually see that there is statistical evidence that sort of helps us to go beyond the headlines that the news media that often tends to become a cheerleader to um, uh, insecurity and violence, and to actually see that there is a data set that we could draw upon to validate the work that we do on a regular uh, basis. So there are a few things that stood out for me, and one of the things that I found refreshing is this whole idea of peace inequality, because often it's very easy for us to fall into the trap of seeing the world as being uh, up in flames, but also to see that there's actually some kinds of differences in terms of what peace is. Uh, but I'm also interested to sort of learn about the idea that wars as well as peace are often contagious. So there's this whole concept of bad neighborhoods. So we're all aware of it. If you live in the U.S., you become aware. If you're trying to buy a house, that's one of the things you look for uh, in terms of how safe the neighborhood is. And we also see this same kind of phenomenon play out at the international level. Unfortunately, if you're a country that is in a bad neighbor, it's in a bad neighborhood, you don't have that option of taking your country and moving out. And so what you do internally and what your neighbors do also have a direct correlation to the quality of life that you can provide to your citizens. So I really found that interesting uh, to see that wars as well as peace uh, tend to be contagious. Uh, in a way, and I think it's good to see that there are uh, um, factors that we could draw upon. It's also interesting to see that wars between states, interstate wars, have sort of become old-fashioned. They are going out of style. Um, that is a good thing. But of course, the other side to that is uh, we tend to have situations where the most powerful also tend to take advantage of the situation, and so they end up making the world uh, less peaceful. And so if we can bring some of these lessons to bear on the international, uh, sorry, on the national um, internal systems, I think we can make a big progress in making the world much more peaceful. Um, there are a few things that stood out for me as well, and one of them is this whole idea of terrorism, which you talked about. Um, part of my discussion, um, uh, part of my interest uh, is in uh, Africa, uh, but also West Africa in particular. And so uh, we've seen how terrorism has also played out in that part of the world. So Al-Shabaab in Somalia, uh, but also Boko Haram in uh, Nigeria, which is now also uh, sort of spreading to other parts of the, of the region as well. Um, and that sort of helps to feed into this whole idea of uh, insecurity uh, in, in, in these parts of, uh, of the world. So I did a little bit of a, of a, of a research. Um, I, over the summer, well, in April, I was in Nigeria um, and Ghana. And this past summer, in June, July, I was in Scandinavia. So I spent time in Norway, Sweden, um, Finland. Um, and so it's almost like going to two different worlds which I think for me sort of juxtaposes the issues that we're grappling with here. So you have Nigeria, which is one of the, you know, the uh, uh, most uh, prosperous in West Africa, one of the largest, 
uh, but also it's a country with a lot of challenges. And then you go to um, Scandinavia, which you know is on the top of those rankings, and then you really see uh, where the challenges and the opportunities um, lie. But I found it very interesting to see that if you take the case of Africa, just looking at the presentations that you made, um, I found it interesting to see that the, 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 the top five killers in Africa are um, respiratory tract infections, diarrhea, mm -hmm. malaria, strokes, and of course, uh, you know, HIV AIDS. So in other words, uh, often we have a system where the governments in these countries tend to prioritize state security over human security. And it turned out that the human security challenges with these countries face in Africa, and I'm sure it's the same for a larger chunk of the developing world, often emanates from this misplaced priority. Okay, I have my march now, just one more minute. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so I think that really is one of the interesting aspects for me, that in these kinds of analysis, we should be able to also look at the relationship between um, the human security um, as well as the, uh, the state security. Um, in my time in Ghana, and then I will, I will definitely end uh, within that time, um, I, I was invited by the, the government to sort of make a presentation on the role that civil society organizations can play in sort of helping the Ghanaian government uh, best utilize its natural resource, its oil. And so I was very pleased to see that on the panel, in fact, the chairman of the panel was the former head of the National Oil Company of Norway. So talking about cross fertilization of ideas. So you have some countries that are actually trying to learn lessons from those that are doing well and to see how this could be replicated in other parts of the world. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, I'm very honored and a bit intimidated to be invited to be a discussant here. Um, my, um, my remarks are really related to um, professionalizing of our field. And uh, I really appreciate this presentation and your frame for it in that respect. My role in our graduate program is to assist with the field experience supervision. Um, and to look at careers pathways um, and how we develop those through our program. So um, this has been something I've been giving some thought to. Um, so uh, one of the things that has concerned me coming into the field of um, peace building and conflict resolution has been um, the lack of research. Um, we have a lot of really well-intentioned people who have very um, important ideas and um, many of those people, many of the programs and the, the instigation of those programs comes from places of privilege. And, um, and we have similar ideas to each other, what makes sense to us makes sense to the funders and there's um, a great deal of thought about how we create programs which generally are thought of as being what people do and um, I think it's relatively new in our field that we're starting to think about what those outcomes should actually look like. And what I've appreciated a lot about what I've read with relation to the, the Peace Index is this visualization of what it is we're aiming at. Um, and beginning to really think about what our theory of change is. How, if we have that vision of what it, what it is we're aiming at, how do we work back from that vision to the activities that we should be engaged in rather than starting with it activities which make lots of sense to those of us who actually aren't consumers of the service, um, but may not speak so directly to people who are consumers of the service. And um, so they may have sort of public relations appeal, but less appeal actually on the ground. And I think this speaks to some of what you were talking about, um, Vandy, with respect to this prioritization of um, national security over human security, that we really just aren't looking at the uh, enough, and we're not measuring it closely enough, um, what the human impact is of programming. And uh, so I really appreciate this frame which invites us as practitioners and also as educators 
to be thinking about how we design programs that really authentically create this opportunity for peace. Um, and to connect it with this data to what the conditions are that create peace so that we can think about how we allocate resources, how we allocate funding, and how we educate people. You know, what, what is it that we should be spending our time teaching if people are gonna be prepared to insert themselves into these situations in, in such a way that what they do is effective? Um, you know, in this field, we have just not, um, and perhaps it's because we've, we've, we're just beginning, we're emerging, we're an emerging phenomena, the, um, the uh, field of, of peace professionalism. Um, peace studies has been around a little longer, but now actually becoming peace professionals is an emerging phenomena in this system that we're trying to create here, a, a peace system, which can actually stand up to and challenge the war system that has been here for a very long time. Um, I think that this kind of database, nine years is a very short period of time. And um, I think that it behooves all of us to remember that, that although it's a fantastic achievement to have nine years of data, it's not long enough for us to really know what trends are. Um, that, uh, the, for example, the very uh, rapid escalation of, of deaths by terrorism that you showed us is still maybe a very short thing. This may not be actually um, a trend that we're seeing. This may still be an outlier blip. In 10 years' time, we may know that. We don't know it now. Um, certainly, it looks alarming right now. Um, but um, an observation that I have of policy making is that we have a, a, a very regrettable tendency to have knee-jerk policy reactions to um, outlier events, what turn out to have been outlier events. But um, once we react to them with policy, they somehow become sort of established as what is. And um, the, 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 that in itself creates a sort of public, um, a public way of knowing about that thing. Um, I, I spent the weekend in Roseburg um, this past weekend. Um, last week, there was a shooting at the community college there. And, um, Certainly, the news has redounded with all sorts of ideas about, is this a trend? Is this a trend that we're seeing? You know, and therefore, you know, what will now happen here at PSU? How, how is the administration reacting to this notion that there's a trend of you know, psychotic crazies who are out there armed to the teeth who are going to come and shoot us all in our classrooms? And how do we respond when that is the media presentation of these kinds of events? Um, it's very difficult when you live in the thick of this much information to discern these patterns. And this is why these kinds of databases are so critical to keep, us, keep our feet on the ground and to show us how to measure these kinds of outcomes so that we, we can have any idea how to respond without um, just reacting. Um, in the ways that have destabilized this region that you're talking about so dramatically with the knee-jerk reactions of American policy in 2001 and 2. Um, things I would like to see more of. Um, um, while I think all of us know that justice must have something to do with this, there aren't clear <coughs> indicators which look at justice and specifically um, either social justice and transformative justice or the use of transitional justice mechanisms or restorative mechanisms for managing harm, perceived harm as distinct from conflict. And I think that that's um, a very important area for us to look at. When I was teaching the transitional justice course, it seemed to me that everywhere that we saw conflict, it was where f transitional justice had failed. And so it seems that measuring that would be very helpful, I think. Um, I also, and this is the last thing I'll say, I know I've had my marching orders too. Um, I also think that um, you, you emphasize in, in the rhetoric of the Global Peace Index the importance of systems thinking and understanding um, these kinds of um, issues in, in a systems frame. Um, in, the, in that way, I think, 
what, what, how we understand countries is very important, but how they connect with each other is also very important. And um, I'm um, European. I've just recently been in Europe. And um, the massive destabilization that will happen with these massive movements of people across borders that um, while nations fight each other, um, there, there are certain kinds of relocations of people that happen and then when there is internal instabilities, there's this, these, there are these massive movements of people and it would be very interesting to me to be um, including some sort of indicator about mass movement of people across borders as an indication of peacefulness and possible destabilization. Um, so I just wonder whether it would, I would love to see more context in that sense for the country analysis and wonder whether countries are the, 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 the largest unit of analysis that is helpful to us as we understand global peace. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, Vandy, and Birol, for those really insightful discussions. So I would like to ask you, Arby, to come back, and we're going to start our question and answer part now. But I would like to give our discussants the privilege to ask the first questions of Vandy, if you have, uh, of Aubrey, if you have specific questions for him now. Instead, um, a lot of my research focuses on the relationship between um, natural resources and conflict. Um, and in the field, there is the concept of um, often referred to as resource cores. Uh, so basically, um, in synthesis, what that means, you know, countries that tend to have a lot of natural resources um, often tend to fare poorly uh, when it comes to some of these indices that you indicated. And if we look much more deeply at some of these, those countries that have experienced uh, conflict, we find out that the good number of them tend to be dependent on one natural resource. So countries basically haven't diversified their economies. So based on the work that you've done, um, I wonder what you saw as the relationship between natural resources uh, in conflict. I mean, that's an excellent question. I also point out you made a point earlier about looking at health outcomes and mm -hmm. I think having an expanded sense of what you mean by personal safety. I think that's an excellent point. I mean, it, um, just to get to that for a second. Um, I mean, one of the one of the things is a challenge for any in, index architect is you have to be very careful to construct an index so you're clear about what its purpose is. You're not trying to do everything. So I think we've made a choice to define the Global Peace Index as a, as a measure of peacefulness, and we've defined peacefulness in a particular way. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that we also have to remember that we're, we want to understand these phenomena in, in a broader sense. Um, so I appreciate that point quite a bit. Um, so in terms of the relationship between peace and natural resources. Um, it's a very complicated issue. I mean, we, we've, we've thought a lot about, can we, can we construct a, uh, some kind of analysis that looks at um, the relationship between peace and, and environmental degradation, for example? Because it turns out the, the direction of travel goes both ways, that, when, that, that environmental degradation can actually be a, a trigger for violence and conflict. And violence and conflict can be a trigger for environmental degradation. So it's actually a very complicated set of relationships. I think when you're talking about issues like resource curse, I'm, I'm not actually an expert on this, but I do think one broad question that people are asking is, um, there, there are some who believe that there are core causes that really govern, uh, that really dictate how countries evolve. There are people like Larry, Diamond at Stanford University, who's very strong, he would look at our positive peace model, he would look at our eight factors and say, the only one that matters is governance. But that dictates everything else. And so what he would say, I would imagine, is that in contrast to some scholars who believe that countries are either burdened or blessed with certain natural resource uh, qualities, 
he would say, really, it's just about governance. That governance dictates whether countries take advantage of their opportunities and deal with their disadvantages, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure what more I can add to the debate than that, except to say that, again, we would really like to tease out some of these relationships between environment and conflict, because you know, we think those are critical. And I guess the last thing to, to say is that if you're looking for a reason to care about positive peace, I mean, what greater shock are we going to face in the next decades and centuries than the shocks related to climate change? And so are our country's ready to. Uh, the our body pack is needed. Our country's able to um, withstand the shocks uh, related to climate change is actually um, a really interesting question, separate and apart from whether we're actually able to reduce the impact of, of climate change. So, anyway. I want to follow up on that. You mentioned Larry. Yeah. Uh, I want to come to. A couple of things that pertain to that research that my research uh, also touches upon in power transition. This thing is falling. <laughs> um, the, the democratic peace theory, for example, assumes that you'll have a more peaceful world as uh, political systems become more democratic and it is very uh, specific about what kind of a democracy. Yes. Um, others say, well, it doesn't matter. It's the degree of government or the capacity of government and ability to, to effectively reallocate resources to keep people happy. But the late Sam Huntington was one of the early ones to raise that issue in the 60s. Um, well, you, you may, as you mentioned, have um, a lid on a lot of frustrations. Mm -hmm. Your institutions are very effective. You're making decent reallocation of resources, but there may be underlying tensions that are never able to be uh, aired out. And the minute that lid, lid is taken off, things m might blow up. Mm. With looking at the two cases, um, in the democratic peace theories, argument of peace, and it let's take the Western and European countries, very peaceful societies, uh, versus others that are, the lid is on. Um, the indicators come out to be fairly comparable. How do you tease out those l little yeah. details that gives us maybe like an early warning indicator? Yeah like the early war warning indicators of conflicts that the, those who study wars have been working on. Do we have things like that to look for uh, in the study of scientific study of peace? Uh, I want to emphasize that because for too long, peace studies have been viewed in, out there as loosey-goosey, touchy-feely, soft, et cetera, et cetera. This is a serious scientific research. And these are kind of things we have to uh, come to terms with as we take this down the road. Has re your research team come um, head on clash with these kind of <laughs> early warning indicators that, okay, we gotta be careful about there and, or here? Well, so a couple answers. One is, so we actually do look at um, whether countries we would categorize as full democracies or more or less peaceful. And we also look at what we call hybrid democracies and authoritarian regimes. It is true that on average, full democracies are, are more peaceful than other types of governance. But interestingly enough, in some cases, hybrid regi regimes, which kind of mix and match some qualities of democracy and some qualities of authoritarian governments, are actually quite in flux and can be less peaceful in the short term than authoritarian regimes. So it's, if you just look at the negative peace rankings, it's, it's not so clear that the more democratic apps you always are, the more peaceful. The prediction game, which again, we have to be very modest about um, because it's very hard to predict the future, <laughs> um, our our best effort at that is through the lens of positive peace. And interestingly enough, if you look at the positive peace factors, um, yes, we do have a good governance 
factor, but that isn't just a measure of whether your country is democratic or not. It's whether or not your governance is functioning. So um, I think it's important that we're, it, it, again, back to like, what are you trying to t accomplish? This is not a global <laughs> democracy index. There, that exists. Like, there are other models that do that. But we're, we're not trying to understand the world from that lens. We're trying to understand the world from the lens of peace and negative and positive states. And so I think what we can say is that um, we are not going to resolve this issue of whether it all comes down to governance or not. But we can say that there are aspects of attributes of peaceful societies in these eight factors or domains, and that a weak, and it is a system, as you pointed out, and this, the factors interrelate in complicated and nonlinear ways, but both as an entire system and as individual factors, you can trouble spot for countries um, in a way that I think we hope will become more powerful as we go on. Um, and I think also it's, I mean, we can get very complicated, and I think it buys us credibility when we can describe ourselves not as loosey-goosey and woolly, and all those things are what we're trying to accomplish. But I think frameworks matter too, and communicating complex ideas in a simple way matter a lot. So when we, when we try to promote this idea of positive peace, just getting people to think about how do you understand my community's capacity for peace and how do I do a diagnosis of that and where am I doing well and where am I doing poorly is really powerful because it allows for a lot more nuance than the typical debate, which is like, am I a democracy, am I not? Did I have an election, did I not? Um, and that doesn't really speak to the full human potential to make change. And so we're, we're starting to drill down in certain places, like Mexico, where we have this Mexico Peace Index. And so just to give one example, um, in the state of Nuevo Leon, which is a very interesting state that just recently elected the first independent governor in, the, in that state's history, Mexico has a very strong state federal system. Um, that governor pledged to publicly to improve the state's place in the Mexico Peace Index. And we are now working with a civic organization called Consejo Civico. Um, they hired us to, to create a Nuevo Leon peace profile, which is both analysis of negative peace and positive peace. And the, the highlights for us in terms of how do you improve the peacefulness of Nuevo Leon is you have to increase the stock of social capital. You have to create more opportunities for citizens to participate in uh, peace building activity. And you have to address corruption. Now, it's not like, particularly corruption is not like a huge surprise in Mexico. Everyone agrees it's a big problem. But the point about social capital, I think, is genuinely interesting. And the framework of thinking about the peace profile of your state in an empirical way is just very, potentially very powerful. And having different levers to pull, you know, is, is really interesting. Um, now, how much influence we can have on actual Policy making is a is such a complicated question. It deserves its whole a whole another three hour session. But I mean, I think we're trying to build not just particular tools, but a way of seeing the world. I think if anything, that's the most powerful thing that we can contribute. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to comment how I how much I think what you're saying is important. That um, we have a place to look. That if, if a country's declining in peacefulness, we now have um, trends in indicators because an mm. overall decline in, indi in, in peacefulness may not actually mean that all domains are declining. Okay. And so we have a place to start looking at, well, apparently this has a lot of effect here. So it may be that Dr. Diamond would be right that in some places governance is all it, it's yeah. about. But um, in other places, that might not be the case. And so I find that very interesting. Um, but my question is actually related to the justice comment that I made earlier. Yes. And I'd love it if you would respond. Yeah. So um, I think those are great comment. And it's close to my heart because, um, as was mentioned in my introduction, before taking this job, I spent 15 years working for an organization called the Center for Court Innovation, which promotes criminal justice reform 
mostly in New York, but increasingly internationally through the court system. And one, one of the really fascinating findings that's coming from the criminal justice world is that it turns out that people's perceptions of the fairness of the justice system matter, um, amazingly enough, more than the outcomes that they experience. In other words, that if you're a defendant in court um, and you feel like the judge treated you fairly, that they listened to you, that you understood what was happening in court, you will report a better experience, even if you were sentenced, than if you felt like you were treated unfairly, but you weren't sentenced. Very powerful, right? I mean, that seems so counterintuitive. And it speaks to this broader dimension, um, which applies to not just the court system, but to the broader world as we know it, that perceptions of fairness, perceptions of legitimacy matter enormously. Um, and we do, in, in fact, include some world values survey information in our positive peace factors. But I think we're only beginning to understand how to capture these ideas about um, the legitimacy of this, the system and people's perceptions of, of fairness. Now, if, I mean, I will point out, I guess, a competing index which measures something different and um, and I think quite well is the World Justice Project, with, which has a rule of law index, where they're measuring the quality of the criminal justice system in 100 countries. Um, and what they do, which is really unique, is they do um, surveys. They actually gather original data. They don't just um, collect existing data as we do. So they've done 200,000 surveys of citizens. And they ask them, basically for their opinions about how well the justice system is functioning. And um, they're, just to follow up a little bit more about them, they're, they have a new project in Mexico where they're gonna take that methodology and apply it to Mexico's 32 states because Mexico is a country that has actually completely revolutionized its criminal justice system. It's changed from the French model to an adversarial model. And so they're, they're going to be doing these surveys in the 32 states of Mexico. And so, I think it's tremendously powerful that there's all this new data and new, all these new instruments um, that are coming together. And so, you know, I think we're, I, the optimist in me says we're at the cusp of, of a much more powerful understanding of, of the dynamics of the world. And I guess the final thing point I make is that you made a really great point about like when is a trend a trend and when is it just noise? Um, and I don't know how long you have to wait to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I don't think we know uh, if 32,000 terrorist deaths is the new normal or just a temporary phenomenon. Um, but I think we all have to be, we have to have a lot of humility. Uh, even about, I mean, this is, I mean, the, I guess I will say that this is, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about ind indices, I'm just gonna say one last thing and I'll stop. One of the things that's really interesting about indices to me is the schizophrenic way that they're treated. So you've been very kind but a lot of people in the academic community tear them apart, just hate, hate it, hate indices. Um, and I've been on the hot seat on many occasions. Um, and they, you know, there are valid reasons for their critique, um, and you can have a very active debate about it. So that's on the one hand, the sort of academic dislike of indices. On the other hand, there's a sort of public and media, like, incredible willingness to trust the facts that are presented without even doing the most basic quality control or understanding the facts that you're using. And I think we try to follow best practices. We're transparent. There's an independent kind of auditing of our processes through our expert panel. We publish all our data. You can do your own analysis of it. Um, but just as a word of warning, there, I mean, there are a lot of indices out there that don't follow those rules. So how do, where's the middle ground between a dis, total dismissal of an index and a total acceptance? That's, to me, it's a very interesting question. This is a very serious index, yeah. this is a very serious index and uh, when people try to tear you apart, you can just tell them, look at it and subscribe and look You're much more direct than I am. <laughs> <laughs> too tired, been there too long <laughs> to put up with it anymore. <laughs> so I'd like
I'd like to open it up now to our audience and please uh, raise your hands and uh, only ask a question when you actually have the microphone because we are uh, recording it also and want to make sure that it's being recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Brian. Uh, and I, I want to applaud you. I, I believe it was John Kenneth Galbraith who said that things that are measured tend to improve. So just the act of measuring will hopefully have a positive impact. But there are a lot of underlying uh, forces that are, are driving these things. So I have a couple of, uh, of questions that I'd like your uh, response to. One is, have you looked at you know, population density yes. versus the peace yes. index? Yes. And the other is economic. There are, there are a lot of economic factors that are pushing towards uh, more conflict. Um, you know, the the, the often called military industrial complex uh, and have you looked at you know the path to peace how, how do we get beyond this how do we deal with displaced military workers and things that are, that, that would actually happen if we move towards peace I mean we will we'll be putting people out of jobs things like that and so we have to actually deal with that because it's disruptive in its own right so it turns out that smaller countries are tend to be more peaceful than larger countries and it actually it, goes up the scale. So smaller countries are more peaceful than medium-sized countries or more peaceful than larger-sized countries. And I think, um, I mean, one observation is just that it's, it's a little harder to kind of govern or pull together um, a larger country. I mean, there are exceptions. Um, and I wouldn't overstate the findings, but it is a trend, in fact, and I think a pretty interesting one. I think the question of where do we go from here, how do we build peace, um, is it's an interesting one. So we have this positive peace framework that we've been working on, but we're really at the beginnings of how to understand it and how to put it in motion, right? I mean, we have to be very careful not to use a kind of linear analysis where we say like, oh, pick this factor and go first. That's the way to do it. That's the, the active ingredient. Because that goes against the whole notion of systems thinking, where you have to try to improve the system as a whole, and where the reality is they're so inter, the factors are so interrelated. I mean, you, you can't, if you have a country that has high levels of corruption, you don't have a country that has good governance, right? I mean, it's just obvious that those things are, are interrelated. So I think the, I think we're really just at the beginning of trying to understand again, how you put these factors in motion and, and how you can improve the system. What, what, it, what is the right investment to improve the system as a whole? Because it's, it's hard to tell a policymaker, oh, like any of these eight things are really hard. Like, oh, you have to do all eight of them at once? Like, oh my God, <laughs> I can't do that. So, but we can't sacrifice the insight, which is that we don't um, know that it's not the case that you can just work on one factor at a time. We, we just had a positive peace conference at Stanford University. This is where I, Larry spoke. And one of, our, uh, one of our contributors there is a guy named Rob Rosigliano, who's previously at the University of Wisconsin, is now, he has the greatest title of all time. He, he works for the, something called the Omidyar Group, which is uh, the group of uh, organizations that's run by Pam and Pierre Omidyar, who founded eBay. Um, and he is the systems coach for the Omidyar group. So he goes in and he, he's trying to inject systems thinking into all the various activities of Omidyar. And the, the challenge with systems is that it's a very complicated way to describe the world and it can become so heady that uh, it's very hard to make sense of it. So I guess an assignment for all of our future scholars is try to wrestle some simplicity <laughs> out of the complexity of systems thinking. So, I don't know, do you want to add to that, guys? We have a program here, System Science PhD. Uh, and there's some beautiful uh, work coming out, systems approach dynamic modeling of these complex systems. Yeah, yeah. And it's, a, it's just starting, maybe 20 years it's taken off, and now showing some real good promise. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any data on the relationship between peace and specific internal variables such as 
degree of ethnic diversity in the country, which overlaps with differences in religion <clears throat> or uh, the relationship between peace and uh, the Gini index, the degree of uh, wealth, the concentration of wealth. Yeah. So we want um, I can speak to positive peace um, because we do include some of that analysis there. So one of the eight um, factors of positive peace is um, acceptance of the rights of others, which we measure through kind of gender equality is a, is a prominent part of that, but it's also about how welcoming the society is to foreigners, which is kind of a proxy for its um, willingness to be a diverse society. So that is very strongly correlated with peace, in fact. Um, the other, sorry, the other question was about, uh, yeah, so Gini, Gini, Gini coefficient is part of our analysis, though interestingly enough, the, the relationship between um, economic growth and wealth and peace is very complicated. And it, it breaks down in certain places in interesting ways. Like Mexico, for example, um, essentially, because of the drug trade and the routes by which drugs are um, taken from Mexico to the United States, some of the wealthiest areas of Mexico are the least peaceful. Um, and so you actually can't really make a simple mapping between income and peace in Mexico. Um, and in fact, if you, some of the, um, the, the relationship between wealth and peace in Mexico has basically broken down. So some of the regions of Mexico that are very rural and very poor are actually peaceful, but they also have low levels of positive peace. So there's a lot of complexity in that answer, do you know what I mean? So um, I guess it just goes to show that the science of peace is really at a beginning period. If it was true that income and peace were simply related, then there wouldn't need to be a science of peace, right? You just have to have science of economic development and wealth creation. Um, but those relationships are actually extremely complicated. There, there is a relationship globally. It's not a, partic it's not a hugely strong one, but it, it breaks down in particular places. Yeah. My question is the, the inequality of wealth in a country. Yeah. So, well, we, so our take on that is, again, one of the pillars is um, inequitable distribution of resources, but we measure that slightly differently. What the measures we're using is for that are the degree to which members of society have access to public goods like healthcare and other important public services. So um, we found that to be more strongly correlated with peace, access to public goods than, than income levels and income inequality per se. So if you, if, a citizen, if citizens of a nation's access to healthcare, good uh, public roads, other government services vary widely, then they tend to be much less peaceful. Um. Thank you. So we have one, one question from our uh, online, uh, online audience. Wow. Dennis Wong from Connecticut uh, asks that earlier in the program, uh, measuring trust was mentioned. And he wanted to know whether or not it's capable, or anyone is capable of measuring fear. Yeah, uh, first of all, hi Dennis from Connecticut. <laughs> we do measure fear. I mean, it's a part of the basic definition of, of peace that we use in the negative peace index. We define peace as the absence of violence or fear of violence. So of the 23 indicators, um, so you see perceptions of criminality up at the top. Um, another measure which, if I scrolled down more, I would get to is um, a simple measure of do you feel safe walking at night? Um, and, you know, th those are really powerful um, predictors. And, you know, there are, it gets complicated because the relationship between fear of crime and actual crime levels would fill the careers of <laughs> enough criminologists to fill this room. Um, so it's a complicated issue. Some people feel uh, a lot more fearful than their actual 
crime levels would suggest. Um, so it's a complicated issue, but suffice to say that yes, fear is fear of crime and general perceptions. Um, and we talked about perceptions of legitimacy earlier as another domain um, are critical to our research and I think critical to understanding this issue. I don't know if you want to add anything. Okay. And then I had a hand over here. You'll be, you'll be next. Um. So I'd rather stand. <laughs> so my name is Dana, and I'm a second graduate student at the CR program. And I'm originally from Syria. I came back. I was visiting, actually, three weeks ago and came back. Um, I was visiting my family. And a few things um, I really, I, I think, for us as uh, um, researchers coming into learning about this work, this is extremely beneficial. I would say... Um, I think one thing I was thinking about when I was looking at it is that although it's a global index, um, I don't see the idea of the globalization in it. So what I mean by that is that it's an individualistic rating and ranking, which I, I personally have problems with. So when we talk about, okay, let's rank Iraq or Syria as bad, and then um, talk about where the U.S. is, it's almost like put the the stigma of badness on a country that suffered an invasion. Um, so you know yes. what I mean? So the thing is, is that yes. uh, it doesn't take into consideration a historical or, um, um, I mean, and I know this is only nine years, but I was wondering about where is that, you know, trajectory of like, okay, so this is, this is what was happening within the context and this is how things now and you know and we if we i'm just looking at it it's only the ranking right so it's like oh this country is bad this country is good mm -hmm. um i also want to uh focus on what dr conliffe was saying is that uh, the idea of like the movement and the transfer trauma i would say so for example in the us even if we want to talk about uh c coming uh those who came from fighting in countries, and they are now, for example, you know, when they are integrated into society, they're hired whether institutions or police, and that's creating the mistrust issue. I think, again, even on our campus, that's what we're talking about, is that those are trained soldiers, they are integrated. So I feel like, and with refugees going to Europe, I feel that's going to become another issue, and how is that contributing then to the peace of those countries who are who have been peaceful, and how their isolation is maybe contributing to this their peace, like Iceland, for example, is so isolated, right? right? The United States is so far from the Middle East where it's, you know, it has wars directly on Afghanistan and Iraq, but then there's that distance. And I remember, I remember so eloquently, um, uh, Harry, Dr. Anastasio spoke about is that people have, some countries have the privilege of distance. And that goes back to the neighboring countries. I could see it just crossing from Lebanon to Syria that Lebanon's going to go next. Like it, there was militarization on the border in Lebanon and a small country like that is not going to take the hit, right, yeah. of Syria. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a long way of, for my question, but I guess like the globalized uh, and historical context, where is it within this ranking? Thank you. So, all right, great. We have some uh, methodological criticism to play with. This is exciting. So um, a couple things, and you've made a lot of really wise points. Um, so I guess three levels. One is we use the country as a unit of analysis. Um, now, that approach has advantages and disadvantages. I think an advantage is that it makes it easy to construct a global index. People understand the construct of a country. Um, but there's some disadvantages, uh, and you've pointed some of them out. Um, Another one that I would add, which is why we want to do work um, on a country level, is that you know, countries have so much regional variation. So to, to use the country as a unit of an analysis masks a lot of change and dynamism within that country. The other thing I would point out is that um, rankings, right? So we use rankings. Let's just say that. Um, and rankings are incredibly popular with the media. Um, the media love our rankings. It drives a lot of our news coverage. But rankings, um, I think you can ask a lot of questions about whether they're methodologically reliable. Like, 
a lot of the countries differ very, by very small amounts, but yet it might matter to them that they're 1 40th as opposed to 1 44th. Um, so I think we've made the conscious choice to embrace the use of, of, of rankings, but you know, there are downsides to that. I think the third thing that you pointed out, which is really interesting, is um, to what degree does our index capture, for lack of a better word, externalities? Like, does it penalize a country for having things occur that were not really in the, the control of the country? Um, and I guess I'd say two things. One is that whether the country is responsible for the conditions within, the, within the, their country or not, they're still experiencing it. So we're measuring peace in that country as it is. And so we have to capture that. Um, the other thing I would say is that we do actually try to accord ex, you know, the externalities back to the producer of the externality because a lot of our indicators that we use in the Global Peace Index do actually capture, say, America's uh, export of weapons or America's involvement in overseas conflict. Um, just to cite one example, Norway fell out of the top 10 of the Global Peace Index for the very first time this year. And the chairman of my organization, Steve Killaway, was giving a presentation in Oslo. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, concern and criticism. And what he said to them, uh, which I think was a, a winning argument, was that it turns out that as a percentage of GDP, this shocked me, Norway is the largest we weapons exporter in the world. Right. Amazing. Right. They have a huge weapons export business. Um, so we penalize them. They dropped in the rankings. That's why they dropped in the rankings. And so I think we're able to capture it to some extent, um, the concerns that you have. Um, but I think all the issues you raised are, are like really good points. Um, and you know, it just goes back to the trade-offs and the choices that we're making. And I think we have a good argument for why we're maximizing the benefit and minimizing the harm. Um, but I would acknowledge that, that you're right to raise those concerns, basically. Um, Oh, who's next? Oh. Thank you. Uh, Warren Banks. I, I, I wonder what we do about missed opportunities. And let, let me explain this background. There are three countries in Central America that have the highest internal murder rate in the world. Yes. Uh, El Salvador followed by Honduras followed by Guatemala. It's 90, 90 a day in El Salvador. There was an agreement reached between those three in the United States and helped by, as I believe, Inter-American Development Bank, uh, that there were, they formed solutions to this situation. Obviously, it would take time to improve it. The U.S. was requested to spend a billion dollars to help implement it, and our Congress, in its, in its wisdom, said no. So how do we overcome these kinds of missed opportunities? Well, I mean, I guess two, two reactions. I mean, that's, uh, we're at, the direct answer to your question is we're entering the realm of politics. And if I knew how to solve Congress's dysfunction, I would be, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know where I would be, but <laughs> be, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I will say a couple things, which is, um, um, one point to, to take from what you said is that, again, back to this changing nature of violence, like those are urgent problems. I mean, they are experiencing civil war in the form of everyday criminal violence. And so we need to understand the urgency of, of working in these countries. Um, the other point I'll make, and I'm more familiar with Mexico. Like Mexico is a classic country where there are a lot of people in Mexico, and particularly government officials who, um, just blame the United States. Like, we're a violent country because the US uh, citizens have high demand for drugs and we're supplying them. And for them, it's like full stop, end of story. And I think there's obviously truth to that, but the analysis that we've done in Mexico is that if you look at what are the strongest correlates of peace or lack of peace, um, it's high levels of corruption and poor governance, particularly poor criminal justice system uh, um, performance, 
And those are things that are within, I mean, there's dealing in a context where there are temptations, obviously, but those are things within the gift of Mexican society to address. And so I guess um, I think for Honduras and other countries, if you go back to this idea of giving them more levers to pull and a broader understanding of what it means to build peace, I mean, I, I, I think that we would hope that they would, people in those countries would take advantage of those opportunities, regardless whether or not Congress is going to come to their rescue. So. <clears throat> Um, Gordon Cran, chair of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace. Um, first uh, comment, uh, while we've been here uh, listening to your presentation, I noticed that the World Economic Forum uh, tweeted your Global Peace Index. Uh, cool. Uh, do, you, do you know the score of the Cubs game? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Toronto. I'm a Blue Jays fan. <laughs> More interested in the Blue Jays tomorrow against Texas. So. <laughs> uh, my comment, uh, there are a number of Rotarians uh, here. And um, as you know, uh, Rotary has been uh, funding uh, Rotary Peace Fellowships, full scholarships for uh, students from around the world at uh, our six Rotary Peace Centers uh, to become professionals in this field. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, how can Rotary and your organization work together? Uh, that question is almost a setup for me, since I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how Rotary and uh, our organization can work together. So. For those of you who don't know, Rotary has 1.2 million members, 36,000 clubs, an incredible institution. It is um, in the final days of, literally, final days of, of ending polio in partnership with the Gates Foundation and the World Health Organization. So um, it's looking, it has to finish the job, but it's looking for its next issue to work on. And peace is one of the six areas of focus of Rotary. So. If, if you're a peace organization looking for a partner who can really make progress, then why not go to the organization that ended polio, right? That's pretty good. Um, we are working a lot with Rotary. Uh, and just to cite one example, um, so we're an institution that cares a lot about educating the public and about communications. And so we, I talked earlier about the media reach of our uh, well, I should, maybe if I didn't, the Global Peace Index reached 1.5 billion people this year. Incredible, like really great numbers. Uh, we invest a lot in public relations um, and in getting our message out. I get on a lot of airplanes and our senior staff does too. So but we're only scraping the surface of what, what we want to do. And so with Rotary, we have this great new program, which we just announced, where we're training Rotary Peace Fellows to become ambassadors for peace research. We're calling it 10 for the 10th, where we're training, get ready for a theme here, 10 Rotary Peace Fellows to give uh, presentations about the 10th edition of the Global Peace Index in 10 new cities. Uh, and we, we've gotten so much interest already that we're probably going to have to expand the number of people we're going to let into the program. So I, this gets back to the professionalization theme. I think we live in this really interesting world now where it's, you know how, uh, this is going to be a really outlandish sounding analogy, but it used to be that rock bands made money selling the album, and they went on tour to s promote selling the album. Now rock bands make no money selling albums because everyone gets it on Spotify or, you know, gets it illegally. The only way they make money is going on tour. So the an analog for us as an institution is that People want to have experiences of peace. They want to like hear from the person who um, wrote the index. They want to give the talk themselves. It's like a new world we live in. And so um, I think that's a great opportunity for people like us, which is how do you enlist people not just as passive receptacles of information, but like active participants in the process of coming out with a narrative around peace. And so the great thing about Rotary is that 
like any, they have 900 Peace Fellows, right? Over nine years, they've put 900 people from around the world, given them uh, two-year scholarships, free ride scholarships to go to a peace-related program. These are very passionate, brilliant people. So for us, it's like an amazing pool to draw upon. But if you start with 10 Rotary Peace Fellows, how do you go to 50, and how do you go to 100? How do you, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, so uh, I guess if you don't know Rotary, you definitely should. <laughs> um, because they're a wonderful organization. And uh, just this one last example. The chairman of my organization, Steve Killalay, gives a lot of talks and speeches. He was invited to Sao Paulo, Brazil for the annual conference. And Al was there, and some other folks in the room were there. Um, he spoke to 15,000 people on the convention floor. And Rotary was disappointed, because they usually get 30 or 40,000 people to a conference. <laughs> He's never, my boss has never spoken to an audience even close to that size. Um, so uh, I'm a big Rotary promoter tonight, but there's a good reason for it. <laughs> so thank you for the question. <laughs> I would like to honor the time frame of our event. That's and and I will put Aubrey on the spot here to offer you up for a few questions afterwards and also if you want to send questions uh, via email, I'm going to put up an address on the website uh, tomorrow. You can send them, and maybe you can also answer those. That would be really great. Um, so thank you for everyone here in the room. And again, thank you for our audience from our friends and partners, Peace and Security Funders Group, Alliance for Peace Building, the Rotarians, World Beyond War, Ray Jubitz. Um, I can only re-emphasize with today's presentation what a unique opportunity those of us who are involved in uh, peace and conflict studies and work, the opportunity we have with that evidence-based data. Our field is growing with such contributions, and we must ask ourselves now, how can we change the narrative, and how can we change the narrative to then change action to get to a world beyond war? Thank you. <laughs>